Okay, I've I've got it. Okay, so yes, for the for the theme of tonight, I wanted to um, focus on a little bit of Yiddish that you might actually use in Jewish settings that perhaps you would find yourself in one day if we can ever be in communal Jewish settings again, and also to come up with an exercise that would allow us to review and to synthesize some of the other expressions and grammatical features that we've learned, particularly being able to conjugate verbs in the present tense. So you have this worksheet called Helik und Tair, holy and precious or holy and dear, which is a phrase that we use in Yiddish for talking about um, anything of kind of Jewish import. Um, so it, it could be a way that we refer to Judaica or to the holidays. Um, so I thought that we would do some greetings and I wanted you to see the pattern, the kind of call and response pattern of how we greet people and respond to their greetings. So you can integrate this into the, the more kind of um, mundane greetings that we had a couple of weeks ago where, where we, you know, we ask people, how are you? And that sort of thing was herzig. So, so you can kind of build a conversation with these and those. Um, these are your conversation starters. So we say good morgen, which literally means good morning. And we say good morgen all the way from the time we wake up until it's time to say good ovent, which is good evening. So really all of the daylight hours, there's no such thing as good afternoon in Yiddish, it's just good morgen. And then the response is, you repeat it back, good morgen, good year. So good morning, good year. And it's the same thing when we say good Shabbos. So we say this, the initial greeting, good Shabbos, and somebody echoes back, good Shabbos, good year. So a good Sabbath and a good year. Um, and the spirit of this is kind of one of maximizing blessing and maximizing good wishes, that you should not only have a good day on this particular day or Sabbath, but that you should have an entire year of good mornings or, or good Sabbaths. So that's good morgen and good Shabbos, good year. And then um, when you when you are parting from someone, particularly um, in the hours leading up to Shabbos, instead of saying good Shabbos, which is what you would say when it actually is the Sabbath, you would wish somebody a good Shabbos, have a good Sabbath. You could also say this when you're parting from somebody that you, you don't anticipate seeing for the rest of Shabbos or until if it's Friday night until the next day. But really at the moment of leave taking, you would wish somebody a good Shabbos. And if you want, you can add on dir und deine, to you and yours. A good Shabbos, have a good Sabbath, you and yours. Um, and then the way to reply to that is you can just echo back a guten. You can say a guten Shabbos or a guten Shabbos dir. You should also have a good Shabbos, but you can also just say more, somewhat more idiomatically, a guten. You have a good one too. Okay. Um, any questions about these greetings so far on this first page? Is it How do you pronounce uh, D A Y N E? A guten Shabbos dir und dein. Dir und deine. 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 Yep. A good job is dir und deine. To you and yours. Okay. And deine is the plural. It has that ein, that e sound at the end, because it's presumed to be plural, that it's you, whoever your people are. Okay. okay. Um, onward to good yontif. So good yontif is general holiday greeting. Um, in Yiddish, the, the correct pronunciation, by which I mean the one that has been um, sort of uh, 
formalized as proper grammatical Yiddish is a, a nun sound. It, it, the letter in the word is a mem, so it, it says on the page, gut yom tov, or gut yom tif, but the way that we pronounce it in Yiddish, when we're actually speaking Yiddish, is gut yom tif. And we see this um, elision of certain mems into nuns with a few other words, and sometimes other letters as well. It's, it's related to the linguistic phenomenon whereby Yaakov becomes Yankiv, Yom Tov becomes Yontif, um, but I'm not a linguist and I'm not gonna go into all the, the details of that shift. So if you hear somebody say, good Yontif, then the proper reply is good Yontif, good Yor. Same pattern of, you know, a whole year of good um, holidays that you're wishing them. Then the next holiday greeting is Gut Moed. So if you're a Hebrew speaker, you're seeing the word Moed, and in Yiddish that becomes Moed. And the Moed refers to the intermediate days of the two long festivals of Pesach and Sukkot. Um, so that if you encounter somebody, the, the first two days are Yontif, they're holy days, and the last two days are Yontif, and all of those intermediate days, the four days in the middle, um, one of which is often Shabbos, um, those four intermediate days are Moed, they are Chol HaMoed, and so the proper greeting then is Gut Moed. Uh, okay. Onward. More specifically now for certain holidays, when we get to Pesach, you'll sometimes hear a Zisen Pesach, a sweet Pesach, a Kosheren Pesach, a Kosher Pesach, or you'll hear both a Zisen and Kosheren Pesach. So you should have a sweet and Kosher Pesach, which I like using both of those because Pesach is a holiday that probably drives us the most crazy with the observance of really specific details and, and preparation. And it, it leaves a lot of room for neurosis if you're kind of wired that way. And so we wish someone a caution in Pesach, but we also balance that by wishing them a zisen Pesach. You shouldn't lose the sweetness of the holiday, the enjoyment of the holiday in all of your preparations to do it to the letter of the law. Right? Um, professor, yeah. can I jump in for a second? Jump in. Okay, so I'll tell you the Chabad custom. Yeah. We have, a, we have a bit of a different twist on the Pesach greeting. Oh, good, okay. So we say, a kosherin und freilichen Pesach. Okay. That's a kosher and freilichen Pesach. So kosher and, and happier or and joyous. Really joyful, right. So really bringing the joy into it, that it shouldn't just be sweet, but it should be actively yeah. Celebratory. And, but I think it's my understanding is it's the same concept is that it's one thing to have a kosher Pesach by the books, right? but it's another thing to actually enjoy it. So we also want you to enjoy it, not just not just get it right. Right. Like, not just sweat the details, but actually have the joy of the holiday. So yeah, very, very similar in spirit. Um, okay. And then similarly with Rosh Hashanah, which is a little bit um anxiety provoking in that, you know, life and death hangs in the, hangs in the balance. So we say, Aziz Gutke Ben Shtior, a sweet, well-blessed year. Is there a specific Chabad greeting before Rosh Hashanah? Besides it. All right, let me think, hold on, before Rosh Hashanah. No, that's the same. It, it would be the same. A good keben shior. Sure, yeah. Yeah, this good keben shior. Okay. Um, so then, after Rosh Hashanah, and really all the way until Hashanah Rabe, which is which occurs on the sixth day of Sukkot, right? So we have Rosh Hashanah, and then five days later we have. Yom Kippur on the, the 10th of Tishrei, and then on the 15th of Tishrei, we have Sukkot. 
and we have six days of um, of beautiful liturgical poem prayers where we're asking for God's salvation. And on the sixth day, we, we really go crazy. We go all out. We do seven of these prayers back to back. And then custom tells us the book really closes for the year. The book of life is really only sealed, not on Yom Kippur, but on Haishan Rabbe. And so all the way until Haishan Rabbe, it's appropriate to wish somebody a good kvittel. And a kvittel, this is a really interesting word. It is etymologically related to acquittance, uh, a note that you would take that, that acquits you of a debt. Um, it's also the name that was given to um, the notes that petitioners, visitors would bring to a Rebbe's Haif, which is to say to the courtyard of a Hasidic Rebbe or a Hasidic master. They, some of the Rebbe's had kind of small operations, but some of them grew quite large and they would have a staff of helpers and administrators. And if somebody came in search of um, prayer or some kind of solace, they wanted an audience with with a Rebbe or whatever the situation was, they would write down or they would dictate what their concerns were on a kvittel. And that would be given to the tzaddik, to the Hasidic leader who was hoping to be able to help them. Um, so that's a kvittel. And another more contemporary, perhaps, use of kvittel is when people write notes and tuck them into the crevices in the Koitsela Maravi, the Western Wall, those notes are also referred to as kvitlach. So you've probably at least seen, if not actually participated in, in that ritual. Um, you've probably seen you know, a photograph of those little pieces of paper. So that can give a lot of immediacy to this idea of a kvittel and of a, a god who is considering every human being and um, considering the, the year ahead for them and responding to, uh, responding to, the, to their situation by, by writing out uh, a kvittel. So you wish somebody a good kvittel, that they should have a good note written for them in the Book of Life. Um, okay, then we get to the holidays that are freilich by Allah Yidin, that all the Jews, you know, not just Chabad, but everybody will use the word freilich or joyful for Chanukah and Purim. So a freilich in Chanukah, a freilich in Purim, those are very common greetings that you will hear for those rabbinic holidays. Okay, any questions thus far about these greetings? Okay. So I'm going to go on to other situations. Um, here's one that you might hear when you go to pay a visit of consolation, when you go to pay your respects to a mourner in a shiva house. And unfortunately, this is something that some of us might be doing over Zoom now. Um, so you can say to the mourner, Zostu wissen nicht mehr von kein Sores. You, so it's Zostu, you should wissen, know, nicht, that's the negative particle, not. So you should not know mehr, any more, any further, any longer, or again, um, von kein Sores. Von, so Yiddish, if you, if you think about like a, a sort of Yinglish speaker, a Yiddish speaker of an earlier generation who, who embedded lots of Yiddishisms into their English, they might talk about, you should know from this, you should know from that, you shouldn't know from this. So that's a very literal translation of how we say to know something, to know of it, to know about it, or to be familiar with it. Um, so you should not know any, and then the word ken, 
that's there, the Kuf Yud Yud Nun, Kuf Tzve Yud Nun, um, that is a negative particle that we use in tandem with nisht. So it's, it's kind of like any in English. I don't have any. I don't want you to experience any more sorrow. The ken is like that, but it's called for in a few more situations where we wouldn't use any in English. Um, we, we see that negative ken a lot in Yiddish. Um, and then tzores, which is often pronounced, so, so tzores in sort of textbook, klausprach, the standard Yiddish, and then tzores for a lot of American Yiddish speakers. Um, so sollst du wissen nicht mehr von kein tzores, you shouldn't know any further sorrow. You've already had enough to deal with. Um, in a similar, in a similar spirit, zolstu haben nor simches. You should only have simches. Now, this one you would you would say at a happy occasion. You wouldn't go to a mourner and say this because they're not experiencing simche, a joyous occasion now, but when you go to a, a wedding or a bar bas mitzvah or a bris or a baby naming or what have you, you can perhaps as you're taking leave, um, you know, going through a sort of reception line or an informal reception line, if there is one, you should only have happy occasions. Um, now, of course, this is not literal. We know that into each life, some rain must fall. Everybody hopefully has occasions to rejoice with the community and occasions to be comforted by the community. But the spirit is one of wishing people that their primary experience should be joy. And then um, similarly, mir zolen zich zen not af simches. Mir zolen, we should, Zich zen. So zen is to see, and then the zich makes it reflexive to see each other. We should see each other, nor only af simches at happy occasions. We should only see each other at happy occasions, which is not to say that if, God forbid, somebody experiences a loss and they are mourning in a shiva house, that I'm going to punk out and not show up, but rather it's that we, we hope that we can sort of push off sad eventualities and focus on the joyous and the positive. Okay, so any questions about these? All right, let's do a very... Oh, Mary, when, yeah. oh, you know. um, when you say we should see each other only at happy occasion. You don't say that at a shiva house. No, you would say that at a happy occasion, okay. right? So, right. <laughs> you're already at a simcha, you're already at a wedding, maybe even perhaps someday a not socially distanced wedding, and you say, we should see each other only at joyful occasions. All right. I just want to add one more thing. It's a Chabad Hasidic tradition that when, when, when friends see each other but are taking leave of each other, so you see somebody but you're, you're, you're leaving, mm -hmm. right? You're leaving each other's presence. You don't say goodbye. You, you say instead, We'll see you again. We'll see you again soon. So it's uh, also like a part of the, I think part of the flavor of, we don't say goodbye. We say, till next time. I just put that into the text. Oh, sorry, that went through my soulish privately. I meant to text everyone. I like that a lot. I'm gonna add it to my list. Zen, which is really until we meet again. We we will see each other again. Right? Um, okay. Good. So quick review of how we conjugate those verbs in the present tense. Um, let's, yeah, it is, somebody asked me, is it like lehit ra'ot? It is the exact spirit of lehit ra'ot, toward seeing each other again, right? See you later. Um, okay, so, um, 
let's do a quick review of how we conjugate those verbs. Um, ich wollen in Atlanta. Sonia, Sonia, wo wohnst du? You have to unmute. Sorry, uh, ich wohne in Atlanta. Du wohnst in Atlanta. Okay. Um, Decatur. Indicator. Okay. Um, Rochelle Moss, wo wohnt Sonia? Sonia wohnt um, in Atlanta. Sonia wohnt in Atlanta. Ja, sie wohnt in Atlanta. Und um, Jay, Jay Rosenhack, du wohnst in Atlanta, ja? Ich, ich wohne in Atlanta. In Atlanta euch, okay. Yeah, done, done with you. Good, okay, in done with you, fine. Und Stan Pollock, wo wohnen Jay und Sonia? Wo wohnen sie? Trying to unmute, okay. Uh, they wohnen uh, in uh, Atlanta. They wohnen in Atlanta. Good. They wohnen in Atlanta. Wer wohnt in Boston? Wer wohnt in Boston? Ich wohne in Boston. Wer? Da Deborah? Ja, Deborah. Deborah wohnt in Boston. Okay. Und sie ist da am Sprache, was wohnt in Boston? Their whole family living in Boston? My Tochter is born in, in, in Boston. Okay, die Tochter, die zwei Tochter? Ja. Die zwei Tochter wohnen in Boston. Okay, sehr fine. Good. I think that you are all ready for this cumulative exercise now. Sich bekennen in Schul. Getting to know people in synagogue. So here is the situation. You're going to Schul, to synagogue, for the first time in a long while. And if you're not Jewish, that's okay. You're still welcome to, to come visit, hang out, eat a little something, drink a schnapps with us in synagogue, right? Now, thanks to the coronavirus, I have no idea when this is going to be. So are you giving each other Rosh Hashanah greetings? Are you giving each other Hanukkah greetings? Pesach greetings? I don't know. Your group is going to have to determine that right? And you're going to decide and greet each other. Every person in the group is going to need to greet each other with the appropriate seasonal greeting for whatever you decide the time frame is for being back in shul or in some kind of communal Jewish setting. Then you need to find out where does everybody live? What are people's names? Who is in their family? And if you feel like there's somebody who talks an awful lot in your group, then you should, you should, feel, uh, you should feel free in this instance. You can, be, you can be a little more assertive than you might be in everyday life. This is Yiddish class. You can tell them, you can use one of the expressions that you know to tell them that they talk a lot. You can remind them that Redden is silver, Schweigen is gold. Um, you can tell them, do, mo do most gemol and mal. You're grinding already ground flour or any other expression that you know um, that, you, that you want to share with the people in your group. Okay, so we're, we wanna really leave some time for this so that you can get into conversations. Try to pull in as much detail as you're able to, as many family connections as you can mention. So you can talk about the previous generation, you can talk about parents who might still be alive, who might not. You can describe them grammatically as if they were still alive, if, if you are not sure about the past tense. You can talk about where they live, where they lived. You can talk about the current generation that you belong to. You can talk about the next generation in your family. You can talk about what you hope the next generation is going to be like as if it already actually were. You can decide where your unborn children live 
um, it's, it's amazing what you can do on the last night of Yiddish class. The, the power is in your hands. Um, so can I just ask you one quick question? Sure. For the introductions and things, the word for husband and wife. Yes. We never got that. Okay, fair point. I want to introduce my husband when I go to shul. Oh, wait, sorry. I just wrote some private message. Be, okay, so let me make this out for everyone. German. German. German is husband. And curiously enough, um, the word for wife is dos, it's neuter in standard Yiddish, although there are a lot of speakers who make it feminine, who make the um, pronoun for vibe de vibe for obvious reasons, that it feels like a very feminine sort of a thing. So der man un dos vibe or de vibe, right? Okay, thank you. Good. So I know that some of you have friends that you would love to see in the breakout rooms, but this exercise will work much better if you're with people that you don't know. So I'm actually going to use the random sort feature. Um, and you're all going to be brave and meet new people and speak Yiddish with them. Her I'll suggest if it's possible, if you're, if you're, um, if your camera is off, when you're in a smaller group, if, if, if at all possible, please, um, you never know when somebody's gonna crawl on you. But yes. if at all possible, um, uh, allow your video to be seen because it'll feel more, more Hamish. That's right. Okay, and I'm creating the rooms, and they're open. Okay. Professor, when do we come back? I'll, I'll give a signal, about 10 minutes. Make it short. I want you to talk a lot. I don't like the work room. <laughs> okay. It's good. Okay, for those of you still here, you should have received an invitation to join a breakout room. Rosita, you're shaking your head. Did you get an invitation? She said no. You should have received an invitation to join a breakout room. Look for a pop-up, look for a notification. It says, it might, it's gonna ask you to join a breakout room. Let me, let me know if y'all see it. Okay, good. It looks like more people are finding it. It should have popped up on the screen saying, the host is inviting you to join breakout room, etc." Here we go. Right. No, I don't know where it is. What, th what type of device are you using, an iPad? No, my computer. So it should pop up on your computer. Now you don't see a you don't see a thing on the on Zoom. No. Is, is no. your is your Zoom full screen? Is it the full screen? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, where should I see it? In the chat? No. It's not gonna be the chat. No. It should have. Let's see. Where would it come up? Um, Knows I wanted to be with Donna and all of that. I don't know why. This... No, no, right. So we didn't do requests tonight. It's okay. too uh, it's too time consuming, and she wanted people to to introduce uh -huh. new people. Esther, did you get an invite for a room? She's still mute. She's 
Chin is to unmute. <laughs> Maybe we are the ones, I don't know, seven participants, seven, but no. No, I didn't get. No. Hmm. Joy is here, Maxi. How about, wait, look, look where it says more on the bottom of your screen. There should be chat, reactions, and more. Do you see where it says more on the bottom right? No, I'm going to open chat. No, no, not open chat. Next to chat, it should have three dots that says more on it near the bottom. Breakout room. Let me open breakout room. There Join you. breakout room. Okay. There you go. Joy, let me let me click here. Click there. That's it. You'll be transported. Esther, did you find the uh, the breakout room invite? I did, and then I lost it. I'm sorry. Oh no, it's okay. So if you look at the bottom of your screen, you yes, should have it. Should say more, and then it says join breakout room. We have it. You have it, yeah. Oh, awesome. Okay, great. She has it. Oh, we can go. Uh, no, I'm gonna be here just in case anybody needs help. I help everybody. Hey, Morris.
Hey, Marsha, we're just coming back from breakout rooms. I had computer issues, sorry. No worries, I'm glad that you're here now. Mitchell, who's with you? Uh, Untata. Wow, nice. Beautiful. He's a ringer. Amazing. I <laughs> love it. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. Hey, Scott, how did you yeah. come back sideways? Galen Yiddish. You may have to repeat. Professor, you're on mute. Orechabe, welcome back. I did not make it to every breakout room, but I made it to several. I heard a lot of good conversation in progress. Um, I heard a lot of creative solutions to the uncertainty about when we are meeting each other again face to face. My favorite solution was the group that decided on Good Shabbos. Good Shabbos, oh, good, because it's always about to be Shabbos. That could really be any time, um, hopefully quite, quite soon. Uh, OK, so now I want to know, for those of you who made it to some of the proverbs, to the Sprichwerter, and who had an occasion to, to quote one of the proverbs. Um, which ones did you use? Toira is the best uh, uh, skyra. Toira, Toira is the best skyra. That's evergreen. A lot of situations where that's good. Um, any other proverbs that you pulled out? A patch for gate avort bestate. A patch for gate avort bestate. Good. Then we did Geschmack is their fish of Yemen's dish. Geschmack is their fish of Yemen's dish. Or their of Yemen's dish. Yeah, if the fish is tastier on someone else's dish, the grass is greener on the other side. I like that one. Yeah. Does it say a shame? That's a really nice one as you're getting to know people because maybe they live somewhere that you find enviable. And you say, oh, I would love to live in such and such location. And they say, oh, der Geschmack is der Fisch auf jenem Tisch. You don't know all the problems we have here with whatever it is. <laughs> association. Association. <laughs> whatever it is. OK. Any other Sprichwerter get pressed into service? Any other expressions? Yeah, yesterday I told my husband, der Meise hat schöne Borg. <laughs> that story has already grown a beard. Has anyone else um, used these expressions in the wild in your day to day life? I used a guter oistruk mat a guten andruk. Andruk. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Okay, so a good expression makes a good impression. A guter oistruk macht a guten andruk. They are fine. Um, okay. Yeah. Did any questions emerge from the small group conversations? Anything that needs clarification? Grandson and granddaughter. We don't really distinguish. We just have anical for both. Okay. It's a curious and we were wondering for teenager, but it doesn't sound like something, you know, that, that you would use in Yiddish teenagers. Well, the whole sense of that, of, of adolescence as a distinct life phase, that really came along very late. And so Yiddish will talk about a bar mitzvah yingle, yeah. a kalamedal, a girl who's of age to be a bride. And that covers a lot mm -hmm. of the teenage years, right? If you think about when people were getting married. So we do have a bocher, which is a young man. We can say a jungerman, a jungermanchikel, 
Um, but there isn't like a neutral word for, for teenager. Yeah. Um, okay. When do you use boy chick? I remember my grandfather saying that. So that's a great English word, boy chick, right? In Yiddish, you would say junger um, or or if you wanted to make it a little bit um, uh, pejorative, you might say a jungach for a boy, a boy who's a real rascal. Yiddish mm -hmm. actually has a lot of words for rascal, but one of them is a jungach. All right, yes. so on the, on the final page of this week's handout, you have some resources for further study. So let me just give some quick shout outs. Um, the League for Yiddish has this fantastic, you can get on their mailing list and you can get this mailed to your inbox. Just go to their website and they have this fantastic resource, which is the list of Yiddish words of the week. And they usually try to stay current with either current events or upcoming Jewish holidays, or sometimes if, if there's you know, no particular thing going on, you'll just get a list on a certain theme. And they've collected them all on the website that I've given to you here. And it really covers a lot, a lot of very useful contemporary vocabulary for situations that come up now. Um, if you found the, the page on family relations a little bit heteronormative and you want to sort of get Yiddish beyond the binary, that's a place that you can go. If you want pandemic related vocabulary, healthcare related vocabulary, go, you know, check out the lists on the League for Yiddish page. Um, there are also links there if you want the, the big English to Yiddish dictionary that just came out a few years ago to know how to say anything in Yiddish. Um, the Yiddish Book Center has all different parts um, which offer a lot of different wonderful things, including um, free PDF scans of almost 12,000 Yiddish books that have been published and they're still working on it and actively updating. And they had to stop during the pandemic because everybody is working remotely and the scanner fills most of a room in the building. But up until that point, they were constantly adding books. And so 12,000, 11,000, I think 549 should be enough to get you started. Um, and so there's a lot there, but if you're not quite ready to tackle reading a book in Yiddish on your own, they also have these delightful Heim Arbet, homework pages. And that is the page that I linked to from the Yiddish Book Center. Um, if you really need an apron that says in Yiddish, she swallows books like hotcakes, that's also your, your destination for that. Um, so that's all at the Yiddish Book Center. Then YIVO has some terrific resources. YIVO is the Yiddish Institute in New York. They have an online encyclopedia that is also free and really, really informative. If you come across a concept or um, the name of any sort of a cultural figure in Yiddish and you just want to get up to speed on who they were, um, Givo Encyclopedia is great for that. Um, you should consider yourself like an, an early bird. I can probably at some point send around an early bird special. I think I'll be getting a, a coupon um, for a discount on Honey on the Page. If you're interested in sharing Yiddish intergenerationally within your family, having something um, from Yiddish culture to share with the English speaking children in your life, I recommend my book that's coming out in October that is already available for pre-order. Um, but as I said, I'll probably get a discount code as we get closer to October and I can share that with Rabbi Solish. Maybe he can, I don't know, can you blast it out to the participants in the class, Rabbi Solish? Yeah, absolutely. For, so let me also say Mazel Tov on the upcoming book. Thank Very you. exciting. Yeah, with pleasure. If you send me um, the link and or the code, whatever, definitely we can send it out to everybody. Okay. And then one more resource. If you are interested in keeping up with 
Yiddish cultural events this summer, um, the YIVO Institute is sponsoring a summer lecture series. They do this every summer in New York, but for the first time it's happening on Zoom. And I think it starts tomorrow. And I'm participating in the series on Thursday. I will be talking about my research on Yiddish children's literature Thursday at 4.30. And so you have the link to register directly for my talk on this list that I've provided. But once you're there, you'll see the other talks. And if there are other ones that, that interest you, um, they are all free and open to the public. There is a lot going on right now in Yiddish over Zoom. Um, and if you have a specific interest like in speaking or reading or learning vocabulary, feel welcome to email me and I can try to give you a more targeted sense of who's doing what and how you can link up with it. Do um, we have your email? Um, I will text it out to everyone, right? Chat it out. There, now you have my email. Hopefully it was on the first week uh, worksheet, but if not, you have it here. It's easy to find, you just Google me and my Emory email will come right up. You're welcome to, to use it. Um, so, Zainishken Fremde, don't be strangers. Mir wollen sich sehen. We'll see each other again. I don't know when, I don't know when it will be in person, um, but the important thing is We'll see each other and we'll, we'll keep speaking. And as my teacher, um, Ruth Weiss, likes to say, There is a long life for speaking Yiddish. So, so may it be for all of us. Sei gesund. Sei gesund. Sei gesund. And I'll stick around if people have questions. But if you need to go, Mir wollen sich sehen. A größer Dank. Uh, Miriam, I want to say thank you. Um, personally, and on behalf of the Intan Jewish Academy, Ayasha Kayach, thank you very much for, uh, for these last four weeks. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And thank all of you for being part of it. We couldn't have done it without you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, Adang. Adang, thank you. It's a fervor. Adang. Say good. Say good. Say good. Say good. Say good. Say good. How come we say Miriam? Yeah. 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 I have a question for you. Um, yeah. You said uh, something to the effect of you see like a long life for Yiddish. What What do you see? I mean, who's going to be speaking it besides like very you know you know ultra orthodox so, people? Right. So about five to six hundred thousand Hasidim who are nothing to sneeze at. Um, they're going to be speaking it. But um, the Yiddish summer programs, the intensive summer programs at the YIVO Institute in New York, at um, the Yiddish Book Center in Amherst and in Tel Aviv at Tel Aviv University, they're bursting at the seams. I mean, they're mm -hmm. turning away applicants. And um, I've taught, I, I've been teaching at the uh, Yiddish Book Center for the last few summers and not only Am I seeing the programs fill up every year, but I see that students who did the first year with us are coming back and doing the intermediate year. Um, and then they're going and they're doing a third year at YIVO the next summer. So, you know, it's not huge numbers, but yeah. there is a, a groundswell of interest and a sense that things are on the upswing with Yiddish. So your students, um what is their primary reason, generally speaking, for taking your Yiddish classes at Emory? So it really changes from year to year. Um, this spring, I was contacted by a first year student 
who said, all my friends and I watched Unorthodox and now we want to learn Yiddish. Mm -hmm. so that is obviously not something that has happened in previous years. Um, sometimes it's a connection with a, a beloved grandparents, a family member. Um, sometimes it's just curiosity. Some students feel really anxious about or alienated by Hebrew because of whatever experiences they've had and they're looking for a pathway toward Jewish knowledge and Jewish learning that doesn't necessarily lead through Hebrew. Um, one student was very honest with me and I asked everyone, like, why are you here? And she said, I was looking at the course catalog and I wondered what could possibly begin with why. Wow. <laughs> okay. Thank so it you. Runs a gamut. Yeah. All Italy, all different kinds. Good. Kenneth, Kenneth, did Selen Aklein Spaß? Aklein Spaß? Yeah. But both nicht. Freilicher Männer kommen zusammen jede Tag. Okay. Sie kibitzen jede jede eine. Ein, einmal the topic, I can't say topic, turns to toit. The master sagt, the master man sagt, ich will wissen, the punkt zeit, as ich gehe starten. Nicht die Jahr, nicht the Monat, but the tag, the minute, the second. The zweite sagt, ah, that's not a kind. Ich will wissen, from Wusser gehe starten. And the dritte sagt, beide me sugar. Ich will wissen, wo ich gehe starten. So they fragged him, for what do you want to know? He said, I will not go to the So I won't go there. I got this is the Chachma. We have to translate the joke. We have to translate okay. the joke. I got it. <laughs> so three, three friends are talking about death, right? And the first one says, I want to know the precise moment of my demise. The second yeah. one says, I want to know the cause of my demise. And the third one says, I want to know the exact location of my demise. And they say, what? How do you want to know the location? Says, so I don't go there. Yeah. <laughs> That's smart. Very good. Very good. Shane. <laughs> Und Shane der Zelt, euch. Yeah. Well told. Yeah. Okay. She said well told. Welcome. Oh, yeah. Shane, good Good Okay. Right, that's good. Okay. No, no, Other questions? I I have a little stupid question. <laughs> there are no stupid questions. I really actually uh, believe that. My grandparents, they did not say Zai Gesund. They said Zai Gesund. Yeah. And I want to know. Okay, so first of all, everything always sounds just a little bit off to me. Yes, because your family speaks Polish Yiddish. They say, it, like Galiziana or something? Yeah, exactly. They speak like Galiziana. Now, let me ask you something and tell me honestly. Okay. Is Zygazint and all that would accompany that pronunciation mm -hmm. more like Cockney <laughs> or more like what the princess speaks. No, it's not. Or not at all. There's not no... a class hierarchical difference. No. It's really a regional difference. And when the, when the decision was made in the early 20th century to create a klausprach, a standardized Yiddish, um, because of who the players were that were involved, they, they had certain compromises of what would draw on which region of Yiddish, and the pronunciation is more like the Litvish Yiddish. So you could say after that, that the, the Litvish kind of became enshrined as the fancy Yiddish, but it's really not accurate to the time to think of one as 
fancier than the others. That I had no idea whether there was any kind of gradation of poshness. Right. No. The, it's, the it's way really regional. You know, there's it, there even in the United States, there's definitely if not a hierarchy, then you can tell someone to some extent, not a hundred percent, but you not can, as much as Britain, to some extent you can tell someone's socioeconomic status by the way they speak and the accent that they have. Even if you have a very thick Southern accent, there's like the fancy Southern church lady. And then yeah. there's the kind of. So, so you could tell, <laughs> you could, you could tell something about whether perhaps very roughly, whether the person was a chassid or a litvak slash misnagid, in other words, not a Hasidic Jew. You could very likely tell that. You could tell um, in, uh, in Northern Lithuania, there's something called sabistikad lasm, which is that the shin, the sh sound gets pronounced as a s, as an s, so that they say, Sabbath for Shabbos. Oh, how weird. It's, it's weird. It's really funny when you hear a native speaker who talks that way. So in that case, you could tell, oh, okay, you're from, you know, Vilna, Kovne, somewhere way up north in Lithuania. But, um, but it's really not a class thing and it's not Any, a... <laughs> um, sorry, the delay yeah. makes you always interrupt people. I don't mean to. Um, Many years ago, I took at the, um, cent I can't even remember what the place is called. It's like the, it's a Jewish family and children's services type mm -hmm. thing. I took this course for uh, being a Hebrew school teacher, even though I'm not religious. I just thought it would be something to, <laughs> worthwhile to do. <laughs> and um, while we were there, we were reciting different prayers. Mm -hmm. And I always said, Vitsivanu, um, B'mitzvah sub. Mm -hmm. B'mitzvah sub. I, oh, that is the, how I learned it. It's the right. only thing that comes out. I have, to, I, I have to force myself to say. And there was this one woman in this class who took such offense. Yeah. What do you care? <laughs> yeah. I said, I'm sorry, my grandparents speak spoke Yiddish and every time I light the candles I'm lighting them with their with my grandmother and my grandfather in my mind you know right, right. not to cry and right. you're telling me I should say it a different way <laughs> so there there was a particularly around the birth of the state of Israel there was a really um uh, fiery controversy. It's known in Hebrew as Ma'ava Kaleshanot, but in Hebrew it's known as the Sprach Melchome, the, the language war between Yiddish and Hebrew over which would be the state language of Israel and the majority language of the Jewish people. And there are little pockets of places people who haven't quite recovered, who still have PTSD from that milchome, from that war. It seemed to me that her... I never met one. That it seemed to me, judging from by her age and the very little bit I knew of who she was, because she was mm -hmm. only another classmate, you know, yeah. I thought there might be some kind of trauma backing up her strong feelings about how I lit the candles. And what was correct and not correct, yeah. 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 Marsha? So hot. You're, you're muted still, Marsha. Du bist verstimmt, you're still muted. If you press the space bar, it will unmute you. You have to hold it. Mute. There you go. You okay. can unmute me. That's okay. fine. Thank you very much. Miriam, I wondered if you had mentioned uh, or could speak to this now. How did you start focusing on Yiddish? Well, what brought you to that focus of scholarship? Oh, okay. So if you really want to know, I gave an oral history to the Yiddish Book Center um, where I, you know, go into this in depth, but I'll try to answer very efficiently. 
Um, I was interested in comparative literature. I was, I was thinking of going to graduate school. And what I really wanted to study in graduate school is the relationship between um, literature and secularization. I was kind of fascinated at the historical process and phenomenon of, of secularization of, of the West becoming secular. And um, I thought that I wanted to study this in relation to, and, and what I was really interested in was in a largely secular world, why did literature continue to be a sort of repository for moral reasoning and moral thinking? So that if you think about the average American public high school, students probably don't study religion, um, they don't study philosophy, they don't study moral reasoning in any formal way, but they have their English class and that's where they learn to think through questions of moral reasoning. Um, so I was very interested in that set of questions. And I thought that I would study it um, in relation to various European novel traditions and the way that secularization was kind of documented through the rise of the novel. And then I went and I had a really life altering conversation with Ruth Weiss, um, who became my doctor mama, my graduate advisor. Um, she said, you know, you, you already speak Hebrew really well. Um, you're clearly good at languages. You'll probably pick up Yiddish really quickly. Secularization happened within a single generation in the Yiddish context, in the Jewish context. You'll have the perfect sort of contained case study for the things that you're interested in if you learn Yiddish. And at the time I was taking Arabic for fun um, and I thought, okay, I'll try Yiddish. And if, it, if I like it, if it speaks to me, then maybe I'll do something with it. So I started, I, I figured I would enroll in a summer program, but why waste a whole summer on the beginner language if I could like jumpstart with the book and catapult myself into the intermediate level, I would do that. So I started with the book, Yiddish, Yiddish speaks itself. I found it very intuitive to learn Yiddish, much more so than Arabic, which is a beautiful language, but it, Yiddish was like handing itself to me on a silver platter. Um, that's so that's how I got into it. Yeah. Did you say you were taking Arabic for fun? Yeah, I was. That's I had just spent a couple of years in, in Israel, and my Hebrew was really, really good at that point. Um, so I thought, okay, lateral move, I'll learn some Arabic. That, that's quite a challenge for a fun thing. <laughs> Mary, is there a lot of film that's in Yiddish around the rise of Hollywood? Were there any Hollywood films made in Yiddish, or that or was more in literature? So, yeah, so there was a really um, burgeoning Yiddish film industry. So, so the first talkie film is The Jazz Singer, made in the U.S. in 1927. So that really ushers in the era of the talkies, right, of films that have um, speech in them. So from 1929 until 1939, we have this golden age of Yiddish cinema. It's really extraordinary. And there were films that were um, made in the United States in Yiddish. So we have a film, Tevye, which has a very different outcome than Fiddler on the Roof, which clings much more closely to Sholem Aleichem's original, um, that is filmed in, um, in a New Jersey that's supposed to resemble Anna Tevke. Um, yeah, so we do have a number of really good films. I own a few. You own a few, okay. Yeah, uh, on VHS. I should transfer them to DVD. Yeah. One is called, uh, I think, De Grina. The, the, it's like a newcomer, you know. A, yeah, De Grina. De Grina. And, De Grina, yeah. And I can't remember what the other one is called. They're downstairs. Okay. I, yeah. I, bought, them, I bought them at um, the old Oxford Books back in the like the late 80s maybe yeah that predates me in atlanta mm -hmm. yeah no any other questions oh okay we'll thank see you. each other again thank you so much bye, bye. Thank you. bye. Thank you.
Bye-bye. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Mark. Bye. 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 Bye.